Hello, everyone, and hopefully uh, you're all back uh, after our short break. Uh, we now go into shortly into session two, and session two is on something close to my heart, a long COVID, and we're going to begin with a video of a patient, Fran, describing her experience of having long COVID. I got COVID in the middle of January 21. I had the most dreadful cough, uh, sweating, sore throat. Uh, I couldn't believe how bad it was. My skin was a dreadful colour. My hair was, you know, very weak and falling out when I did get into the shower. Um, my husband had to look after me um, help me sit up in the bed help me go down to the toilet um, i wasn't eating i was drinking but i wasn't really eating i wasn't that um hungry the cough has stayed with me um it's not ha not as bad at all but um it's still there um i have um i get hoarse in the mornings every morning i get up a lot of mucus, uh, white mucus. I get a lot of infections very easily now. I've, I think I've been on um, four, four, at least four antibiotics since Christmas uh, for chest infections. Um, I also, it damaged the muscle tone in my voice and um, so I had to go to a speech therapist. I lost my voice for about three months. I was kind of only a, a whisper or very, very low horse kind of voice. Um, so that eventually came back after all the exercises that the specialist gave me. I'm just walking in there. In a field, um, there's going to be a little hill now, just uh, coming up to it now. I slow down a bit, always. So that's usually the way I am when I'm out walking. I still get um, a lot of tiredness aches and pains, my legs, aches and pains. Um, uh, forgetfulness is dreadful. Brain fog in the middle of a sentence, I'll, I'll forget what I'm saying. Um, and, oh, sorry, I was sent to a COVID clinic in Dunleary, uh, St. Michael's Hospital. And I did eight weeks there, two days a week and it was just excellent. They did exercises with us and the staff were just really nice and helpful. Um, I tried to keep up the exercises when I was, when the eight weeks was over, um, but I would have loved, and so would the other uh, five people that was in my class with me, would have loved for to be able to have done it even once a week or even once a month, I suppose, anything. But you're kind of left to your own devices and then we're brought back every six months for uh, checkups. What I find the best of it was that other people there, men and women, all ages, were all, they, we all just completely understood each other. Um, you weren't afraid to say different things because they would come back with other stuff that they would be suffering from and some would be the same, some wouldn't. But it was just so helpful because nowadays if people say how are you um you'll kind of just say okay because you don't want them to think that you're moaning or you know dragging this COVID thing on that they think is you know shouldn't last so there's many that would love a clinic that you could check in with or um just maybe text or email for some advice on different things um, or groups to meet up 
um, with the clinic that you could have a chat and see where we're all at or something like that because there's not enough I uh, feel it's like COVID is kind of uh, it's gone and we're just left to deal with the aftermath of it all. Okay, uh, I think we all have to thank people like Fran that uh, have been, you know, so brave to share their, their, their feeling, their experience. And it is not easy. Uh, I've uh, been in her position to give a talk about my story as well. You cannot imagine how difficult it is to manage feelings like anger, frustration, you know, um, sadness. So it's very difficult, but I think it's really helpful because it uh, helps uh, everybody, the patient in himself and, and, and the people that they are dealing, you know, the healthcare professional dealing with that. It's not easy. And so we're going to start uh, this second session by introducing somebody that has uh, a great knowledge about long COVID. He has been in the task force, he has been leading, you know, the task force to define long COVID for the first time uh, in, in, the, in the world. And he has been uh, suffering COVID as well. So again, as in my case, with a double uh, face somehow. So I'm really glad to introduce Dr. Joan Soriano, the, Soriano that is not only a good friend, but also a professor in the Medicine University Autonoma de Madrid and of Ilias Baleares. So I think he's going to give you uh, a scientific and um, very good uh, uh, explanation about what long COVID is nowadays. Joan, please, the floor is yours. Is yours. Thank you indeed, Eva. It's great to see you. And while I'm asking for the uh, people at the uh, webmaster to let me share my screen, I would like to say that uh, it is uh, a privilege to, uh, and especially I would like to thank Kiel, Helen, Claire, and everyone at the ELF, because the opportunity to talk to patients from all over Europe and beyond is a privilege. Can you hear me and see my screen now? No, I can't see your screen. Uh, so do you want to try sharing your slides? We yes. can see and hear you. Let me just try again. Hold on. Share. Can you see it now? No, uh, we've got your slides here, so shall we share them and then um, we can move them on for you? Yes, please. Yes, please. So we'll go for plan B. Okay, just give us a moment and we'll uh, share mm -hmm. the slides. Okay, we should be able to see your slides now. Thank you. Great. So thank you again. Apologies for this technical issue. The title that I've been giving is What is Long COVID? The Research Findings. Next, please. During the next minutes, this is the agenda I will cover. After a brief introduction, I would like to talk to you about definitions, about mechanisms, and even if I've granted uh, 10 minutes, I would like to be ambitious and talk to you about a practical exercise, a real case record from a real patient. The intention is not to test your skills, most of you are patients, but to let you know the difficulty in the diagnostic process in this very nasty virus and this very nasty disease. It's actually very difficult, the diagnostic process. So next one, please. Why are we here? Because even in respected journals and even from very highly prestigious centers, there are still people that question the existence of long COVID. This is a paper in JAMA Internal Medicine late last year from French researchers that they were questioning that actually there is a misunderstanding in between the disease and the consequences of the disease. And the editorial accompanying this paper was, is long COVID even real? 
Of course it is. We see it daily. And the consequences are in this webinar and beyond. Next, please. This is the first publication that came in the West uh, already in January 2020. It was a letter in science. And if you see the next activation, please, the animation. In here, you could read this Chinese scientist that was saying it is a limited outbreak. If no new patients appear in the next week, it might be over. Well, now in almost three years, we have had more than 600 cases, 600 million cases of this disease. So indeed, in January or February 2020, it was not over. Next, please. And in particular, when we saw that even new hospitals were built in the Wuhan area, the people got scared. Next, please. So actually, we know a lot about COVID-19. And in particular, if you go to the usual repositories of medical information that we have, PubMed for publications in medicine, and you do a search last month with just typing COVID-19, animation, next, please. We can see that we got more than 300,000 peer review publications in less than three years. For comparison, 300,000 publications is more than what we know in 40 years about HIV AIDS or what we know from history all time from asthma and COPD together. 300,000 publications in less than three years means that you should be a fast reader. You should almost read 300 papers per day to be fully aware about all the information that is available. That is reading and acknowledging one paper every five minutes without weekends, without sleeping. So again, this is impossible. What we need is to aggregate this information. Next one, please. And in particular, in my hospital, we suffer a lot, especially the first wave. This is one of my favorite books from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the Colombian author, Love in the Time of Cholera. Well, we suffer almost something like cholera and something that pandemics got, we thought they were over. We were humbled. This photograph was taken in April 2020. Here you see some nurses and young residents in the ward of my hospital. They were so happy because they received the protective equipment. For one month and a half, we were fighting this virus with trash bags. So these were the first protective equipments and they were posing like in a World Cup team in the World Cup in Qatar. Next one, please. So let me just go to the issue of definitions. Next. And on definitions in health, the director of the World Health Organization, here you have this photo, Dr. Tedros Adnanon Ghebreyesus, was saying in this letter editorial in Nature, in October 2020, that patients, we have received your SOS. We have heard loud and clear that long COVID needs recognition, guidelines, research, and rehab, especially because we need a full WHO response about it, about long COVID. Next one, please. And I was privileged to be called to Geneva. Initially, I was going to do a testing and a modeling of flu with COVID-19. It happened that during the first waves, there was no flu in the world. So my team advanced in the update of the clinical guidelines, and especially, and this is the thing that I will talk about you, when for defining this new condition, long COVID, post-COVID-19 condition, or other name. Next, please. The naming in medicine is something that takes some time. And I would like just in one minute to review this publication, Lancing Infectious Diseases, with a group of WHO people and external people, including patients, that we were able to produce a first definition by Delphi consensus of long COVID. Next one, please. Definitions in health are difficult. Probably you remember from Shakespeare in his play, Romeo and Juliet, the dialogue when Juliet is saying, 
what's in a name that which we call a rose but by any other name it would smell as sweet and this definition of the smell of a rose is something similar that what we have to define asthma or what we have AIDS, fibromyalgia, post-intensive care unit syndrome, or other medical conditions. And we can be poetic or we can be scientific. And or we can do both. But if we have to be scientific, we need to go to Delphi. Next, please. Delphi is a physical place in Greece, but also is the name of a method to establish consensus in issues that are difficult to establish consensus. So the Delphi Shrine is something that you can visit. I would strongly recommend you to go there to Greece, just to go to Delphi Shrine. But the Delphi method is something that we use to define new conditions. Next one, please. I will not go into details about these statistics, but in a way, we all have our opinions, patients, basic researchers, clinicians, epidemiologists, and the statistical rules as per research protocol in a Delphi method is that we have to force consensus. So in the activation, next please. And next please. The idea is that in a Likert scale that goes from one to nine, one is no agreement, nine is full agreement, you identify if people have they are in full agreement with more than 17% or in total disagreement if they have at least 35% of the panelists attending one Delphi survey in both extremes. And you eventually have one, two, three rounds and get to an agreement. Next one, please. In particular, these were the elements that we discussed in 2021 included in the definition of long COVID, especially patients were very persistent that not only we needed a definitive history of SARS-CoV-2 infection, but also of probable SARS-CoV-2 infection, especially because during the first months in the UK, in France, in Spain, everywhere, we didn't have tests. So everything was a clinical diagnosis, not a laboratory diagnosis. Then important on the duration. The symptoms had to be present for at least three months and persist for more than two months. These were, again, thresholds on time duration that were achieved by consensus. And important, the entire battery of symptoms that you have listed here in this slide could not be explained by an alternative diagnosis. Next, please. After two rounds of discussion, this, the one sentence that you have here in the slide, is the WHO clinical definition of post-COVID-19 condition or long COVID. I will not read it because it would take me one minute. But the important thing is at the bottom, word count, 96 words, eight lines, size two in word. This is a very long definition, perhaps not practical, but this is a first step, a first step to talk the same language. Next one, please. So briefly, I will touch on mechanisms next. And in terms of mechanisms in the US, they already got something what we don't have in Europe. The NIH, the National Institute of Health, committed 1.1 billion US dollars to the study of long COVID, especially because if we do not study the basic of long COVID in the lab, we will only treat patients with medications that we receive for other things, but we will not have a specific new medicines. You patients have to help us to lobby for more research funds in the European Union, in the UK and beyond, especially because next, there have been at least seven mechanisms. In the chat, Anne Moody from Ireland was talking about the immune dysregulation. This is only the second of seven mechanisms involved, and I'm highlighting this at the least seven. One is inflammation, two is immune, three is coagulation chlorine, four is direct viral toxicity or perseverance, persistence of the virus, five is autonomic dysfunction neurologic, 
Six is endocrine, and seven is maladaptation of the receptor, the ACE2 pathway. But likely, there can be more mechanisms, and many will interact synergically even in the same patient. So what we need is, again, as Tobias Velte was telling us, more research. Next, please. And I will finalize, as I said, talking about a true case record from a true patient. Next one, please. And if we can read, this is a case of a 54-year-old man with dyspnea. Dyspnea is shortness of breath. It was seen, this patient, in a pulmonary clinic because of increasing dyspnea of moderate efforts. The chest imaging conducted by X-rays was normal, and a number of diagnostic procedures were performed. This man has no known allergies, was an average smoking, just a mild social drinking without binging, and took no drugs. Again, let me emphasize that the idea of this exercise is not to discuss technically how, but to show you patients how difficult it is to deal about this disease and this virus. Next one, please. So this is the chest X-ray of our patient. You can trust me that either in the frontal chest X-ray or in the lateral X-ray on the right, this is normal. The imaging of the lungs of this patient identified no pneumonia, nothing. It was a non-smoker with normal lungs in the X-ray. Next, please. So if you do the clinical record of this patient, you identify that he had Achilles tendinitis, a sports fracture in one foot, a depressive disorder ill-defined in 2014, or blood in the urine, hematuria of a non-origin before. All these things are normal in an individual of his age. But the current problem started this year, March the 10th. As I said, this patient had dyspnea, shortness of breath, of in the scale of the Medical Research Council, two or three out of a scale of four. So it was already moderate shortness of breath. This patient had edema in one ankle and leg, and the blood pressure was very high, had blood hypertension, 190 systolic, 110 diastolic, with a heart rate also high of 100. There was no pain, there was no temperature, there was nothing else. When we were talking with this patient, he was identifying the event, and the event was uh, occurring in February 12, 2022, February 12 this year. The shortness of breath started abruptly after swimming in very cold water on a Saturday. That same afternoon, our patient was unable to cycle his usual activity and had two stopovers in his way home. And actually, he was feeling very ill. Next one, please. If uh, we check the history of COVID-19 of our patient, we can see that he had Omicron. And in January, in January the 12th this year, has a positive test with COVID-19 an antigen test. This time with acute COVID had no symptoms, had one week of lockdown and nothing else. Regarding vaccination, he was a patient that received all the vaccines that you could imagine because he's a world traveler. The MMR, the DPT, yellow fever, hepatitis, typhoid, and tetanus booster. And also very importantly was receiving in 2021, February, 2021, the vaccine of Pfizer-BioNTech, and two boosters in 20th of March, 2021, a first booster, and then the booster in this year in March 22. Next one, please. So we can see the tests that were conducted in this patient that had a respiratory problem. Already we saw that the Chexis ray was normal. Next one, please. There were a battery of tests contexted. In the blood, tests were normal. In the electrocardiogram, they were seeing these anomalies, tachycardia, a high heart rate, right bundle branch block with isolated inverted T waves in three derivations, 
in a way these were kind of specific. They perform spirometry, blowing in a particular way, and the spirometry, the results were normal. They perform two exercise tests, one with a treadmill and one with a bicycle. They were normal. And then they perform diffusion of the carbon monoxide to identify the oxygenation of the lungs, and they were also normal. Next one, please. And next. So everything was normal, but then someone said, what about if this individual had a pulmonary thromboembolism? So next one, please. They had a new blood test and they got this marker, D-dimer. D-dimer is something that helps in the diagnosis of pulmonary thromboembolism. The results were 520 international units. It was a little bit increased, but not too much. And the physician in charge requested a CT scan with contrast. Next one, please. This is the CT scan of this patient. I cannot use the laser pointer, but here you see the lungs, they are the quality air, they are black, but on the left, you see the left arterial, pulmon the pulmonary artery, and there is a blockage of 60%, but then on the right, there is the right pulmonary artery that has a blockage, it was occluded 80%. So basically this individual had a pulmonary embolism of both pulmonary arteries, identified by the radiologist as something very severe, and our patient was admitted. It was admitted for five days, it was punctured with heparin, and it was discharged with a pixaban. Next one, please. Our patient improved quite well. And it was a progressive improvement of his dyspnea until, next one, that one month later, again, in the bicycle or running, he was shortness of breath. The physician in charge requested a second chest imaging with contrast, and he was having a second pulmonary embolism. In the echo Doppler, and you have the reporting here, it was also identified that in his right leg has a chronic deep vein thrombosis of the popliteus vein. And in the echocardiography, echocardiography this was something new. It was pulmonary hypertension, mild, and a hypertrophy of the right ventricle. Next one, please. So this patient now is in referral for a specialty clinic of severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. So we have seen our patient on the full clinical record. Let's play. Next one, please. What I would like to you is to help me in the diagnosis. And I give you five options of what is the diagnosis of this patient. Claire, I don't know if we have the active pole, but option A is long COVID. Option B is pulmonary embolism, idiopathic pulmonary thromboembolism. Option C is SARS-CoV-2 vaccine adverse event. Option D is anxiety. And also, finally, option E is I don't know. Please vote. John, I think there was some uh, mistake because uh, what the, the question uh, was, uh, I saw on the screen was about long COVID definition, while your question in, on the slide is different. Right. Now so the question, I agree that there is a, uh, the poll has the wrong title, but the question is, what is the diagnosis of this patient? Okay, I'm seeing that uh, other people are seeing the right question, so. Mm -hmm. can... Okay, Claire, can we unblind the result? Um, and we see several. Uh, the majority said it is long COVID, then PTE. A few said an adverse reaction to the vaccines. Uh, and some people say, I don't know. Thank you. And... I have to say that you are all right. Uh, if we go back to the presentation, I have the permission of the patient to tell you what is the diagnosis. 
and actually have the patient with me here in the room. Actually, you are seeing the patient. The patient that I was showing is myself. These are the five diagnoses that I received from my colleagues, including anxiety. They said that while I was suffering with this imaging was anxiety. But all the other things, including an adverse reaction to the vaccines, is actual diagnosis that I have received. If I go to the definition of the WHO that I helped to publish in Lancet Infectious Diseases, you see in green the things that my case concords with the WHO definition, but in red the things that I do not follow. So the point is that even if you are someone that has a criteria that live in a country with universal health coverage and that you have access to all the diagnostic tests that you could think of, still the labeling of someone with long COVID is very, very difficult, sometimes impossible. Next one, please. This is actually my record. If you put it in the scale from December 2019 that the virus is starting in China, my first two vaccinations in February and March 2021, my Omicron in January 2022, the vaccine booster that I received in March 2022, and the timing of my two pulmonary embolisms in March and in June 2022. So not an easy thing to label someone in one of the five diagnoses that I received. Next, please. So I'm going to conclude and saying that uh, two activations, please. Next and next. And one more. The little square that it just show here is my case. Is someone that had Omicron, that had acute infection with COVID-19, that received no care at all, not only in the hospital, but not even, I was just confined at home with no symptoms, but in a few months later, received a deep vein thrombosis and a pulmonary embolism. So this is something that actually the paper took three years to be published from the UK Biobank uh, in heart last month. Next one, please. So I'm going to conclude. And in the next, you see the place that we are with many COVID-19 patients that are suffering long COVID. This is the pathway of their disease. Unfortunately, you see in here a primary care doctor trying to agree with a chest physician, with an internal medicine doctor, with an ear, nose, and throat, or with a surgeon. What is the diagnosis of these patients? And as I told you, sometimes it's not an easy target. The important thing next is that both patients and doctors do not smoke because smoking is a confusing factor, particularly in long COVID. I cannot talk about this, but I can talk about this in the next time. So in the next one, let me just conclude with some three remarks. Number one, that the definition and a name, long COVID, is a first step in the right direction to establish a dialogue among specialists and among specialties, including patients. The long COVID, probably I try to prove it to you, is a big clinical challenge and not an easy one. Three years is not a long time when you have a new disease. And that we have an urgent need to quantify thresholds, how many symptoms, the durations and the timings. As you can see in the boat rowing in the same direction, patients, physicians, basic scientists, we were all together in this problem. We will only leave this problem all together. Thank you. Uh, wow, Johan, Johan, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. And as someone with long COVID, in some ways, it's great to hear the experience that you've gone through. But in some ways, I despair because we are really struggling to get any kind of answer or support uh, as, as long COVID uh, patients. And I think that's the case, not just in the UK, um, but around many, um, many areas of the world. But you've really brought uh, a, a real attention to detail uh, in what you've said. So thank you so much. Uh, that was really inspiring. Thank you. Um, without much further ado, I'm going to introduce our next two speakers, and, and they're going to focus on uh, treatment and rehabilitation options for long COVID. 
Um, so I've got uh, Professor Ionos Vodjas, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, uh, Ionos, so apologies there. Um, the Professor of Rehabilitation Sciences at Northumbria University in the UK is going to look at physical treatment and rehabilitation, and this I'm going to really enjoy. And then Dr. Tracy Vannerstall, who's the Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioural Sciences at jo uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital in the USA, is going to describe the psychological options, uh, sorry, the physiological options. So I really appreciate both. And I hand over to uh, you now. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen. Can you see my slides? Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. So I'm going to talk about the rehabilitation for long COVID-19. And this is my first slide. So according to the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, long COVID describes signs and symptoms that continue or develop longer than four weeks after uh, COVID-19. And as you can see, it is associated with symptoms like fatigue, post-exertional malaise, brain fog, headaches, uh, and related symptoms, memory issues, insomnia, muscle ages, shortness of breath, and joint pain. These symptoms affect the physical, cognitive, and mental functioning of individuals and lead to reduced activities of daily living and impaired quality of life. And this has been shown by this very nice post-COVID multicenter trial that evaluated symptoms in previously hospitalized patients with COVID-19 five months following hospital discharge. So as you can see here on the left-hand side, 50% of patients five months post-hospital discharge felt that they had not fully recovered uh, after hospital discharge and only 30% of those patients felt that they had fully recovered. Now, what is interesting to see on the right-hand side is that those not fully recovered indicated an average number of 14 symptoms, whereas those who declared that they had been fully recovered still indicated uh, an average of three symptoms. The most common symptoms were fatigue and muscle weakness, uh, mental health issues, uh, including anxiety and depression, Cognitive impairment, including memory loss and concentration disorders, shortness of breath, chest pain, and tightness. More recent data from the FOSP COVID consortium suggests that 12 months post hospital discharge, the proportion of patients who declared that they had not fully been recovered has remained unchanged and is equivalent to 50%. And therefore, this highlights an urgent need for multidisciplinary rehabilitation. Now, considering the aforementioned physical, cognitive, and mental dysfunction in long COVID, the European Respiratory Society and the American Thoracic Society, early during the pandemic, issued interim guidance on rehabilitation in the hospital and post-hospital phase, taking into account the opinion of 93 experts from 30, 23 different countries. And according to the proposed uh, care pathway, uh, this includes rehabilitation at or around the bedside, and also assessment of oxygen requirement at less at rest and during exertion. Now, within six to eight weeks post-hospital discharge, the pathway suggests um, regular physical activity and low to moderate physical exercise at home. Importantly, within the first six to eight weeks post-hospital discharge, the experts suggest a formal assessment of physical and emotional function together with uh, assessment of uh, unmet rehabilitation needs. Based on this initial assessment, patients should receive a comprehensive rehabilitation program along with a muscle strengthening program, as well as nutritional, psychological, and educational support, as well as support for uh, self-management. Now, at the same time that the ERS and ATS issued specific uh, guidelines, the BTS here in, in, the, in Britain also issued guidance on delivering rehabilitation to patients surviving long COVID by using an adapted pulmonary rehabilitation program. So according to the BTS guidance, patients eligible for this program are those who received care on ICU or they had the mechanical ventilation, those with prolonged stay, with or without oxygen therapy or no invasive ventilation, patients with core respiratory symptoms with an inpatient stay, but also those patients who were not hospitalized and still had persistent symptoms. 
Now, according to the BTS guideline, the most important thing is to have appropriate infection and prevention uh, measures. It is important for the physiotherapist to take you know, a careful uh, history record and make sure that patients are safe to exercise. Uh, those who have thromboembolic conditions, uh, myocarditis, or they have exercise-induced arterial hypoxemia should not be uh, exercised. In addition, the program should include assessment of uh, the capacity to exercise safely, to assess symptoms, to assess quality of life, to assess anxiety and depression, and cognitive impairment in order to tailor the program to the individual needs uh, and capacities. And the program itself should provide exercise training, educational, psychological, and nutritional support. Now, this is the exercise component of a typical adapted pulmonary rehabilitation program. And you can see on the right-hand side uh, a photo from our rehabilitation program here in Newcastle. Typically, the program is attended twice weekly uh, for six to eight weeks. At the beginning and at the end of the program, it is necessary to assess uh, working capacity, but also to assess the strength of the upper and lower limbs. Furthermore, it is important to assess quality of life, to assess chronic dyspnea, chronic fatigue, memory loss, and other quality of life aspects. Now, the exercise training program includes low-grade aerobic and resistant exercise. We always start at the low level and progressively we increase based on symptoms. But also, and this is very important according to the video we watched earlier, uh, physiotherapists prescribe walking drills for patients to perform indoors and outdoors, and especially when the program uh, is completed. Now, the educational component includes a number of topics like getting moving again, managing daily activities, uh, managing uh, sleepy, sleepy, sleep disturbances, managing fatigue and dyspnea, uh, loss of taste and smell, but also there are two techniques to conserve energy. The uh, psychological and cognitive um, support uh, includes topics on post-traumatic stress and cognitive impairment, on psychological and emotional support, on techniques to treat fear and anxiety and sleep disturbances, but, but also provides uh, support to uh, help patients uh, dealing with um, daily activities. Now, besides the face-to-face -face rehabilitation programs, there have been several digital programs. This is one by the NHS England. It is called uh, Your COVID Recovery. And this digital program contains a range of resources to help uh, an individual to cope with COVID, but also help patients progressing through uh, physical activity goals to improve their physical capacity. This is a rapid review of the literature on the effectiveness of permanent rehabilitation on long COVID patients. And the review presents results from nine uh, studies which have a different uh, setting. This can be inpatient, can be outpatient, or can be rehabilitation. What is important for you to appreciate is that uh, irrespective of the setting or the duration of the program, these early studies show, show that modalities, pulmonary rehabilitation modalities, lead to improved exercise capacity, quality of life, and symptoms of breathlessness and leg discomfort. And this is my final slides with con uh, concluding remarks, like outpatient and digital rehabilitation in post-COVID-19 patients uh, with persistent symptoms and exercise intolerance appears feasible, safe, and effective. Uh, the prescription and provision of physical rehabilitation should be guided mainly by persistent symptoms and functional limitation, limitations, so the program should be tailored to each individual patient. It is important to provide uh, activities of daily living training to patients, even if it is necessary to consider home modification, as this is needed and it is essential really to uh, accelerate physical recovery. Also, persons with physical deconditioning and weakness should start exercise that help in recovery of daily functioning. And when these exercises are well tailored and well uh, tolerated, uh, patients should proceed with progressive whole body and peripheral muscle strengthening. And finally, supervised patient tailor programs need to be flexible enough to adapt to patients. So most of the patients who come to our rehabilitation program these days are quite productive. They have to go to work uh, during the day. So we need to adapt our programs uh, in the evenings in order to be able to support these patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, we're now heading over, handing over to Tracy. So, Tracy, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Um, if I believe only one person can share screen at a time. 
There we go. Let me make sure that I'm really. Are you able to see my slides? Or are you seeing the whole thing? Uh, we can see your slide, thank you. Okay. Can you see my notes as well, or just the slides? We can see your notes. Uh, can see your notes. My apologies. Well, let me and that and just do this. Normal. There we go. That should work. Great. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. I will try to move quickly since we are uh, running a bit behind. So I'm a neuropsychologist. And what that means is that I study the brain and the way that physical health conditions impact our thinking skills, as well as our mood and well-being. And by cognitive symptoms or thinking skills, we're talking in the context of COVID of brain fog or difficulties with attention, concentrating, multitasking, remembering. Um, patients are often tell me that they're more forgetful. They have difficulties finding their words, planning, problem solving. So um, for different patients, it can be manifest by a number of different difficulties across different cognitive domains. From a mental health perspective, that I'm referring to mood changes. And those can be symptoms of depression, like low mood and irritability, as well as reduced motivation and drive. Anxiety, like tension and a worry. Um, and our patients who have been in the ICU were concerned about post-traumatic distress. Many of these patients will experience a delirium where they can um, have very, very sort of frightening experiences. And then we also have very rare cases of post-COVID psychosis, um, where patients are not delirious in the hospital, but they're having a new onset of um, a major psychiatric um, cluster of symptoms. It's important to note that we think that, that COVID can be the can kick off these issues in some patients. Patients who never had cognitive symptoms or never had a history of anxiety or depression are more likely to experience that after COVID, but also patients who have pre-existing cognitive vulnerabilities or a history of anxiety or depression may be, um, may be more prone to experience those symptoms after their COVID-19 illness as well, and those might be exacerbated. So who has these types of neuropsychological long COVID symptoms? Well, recent review studies tell us that nearly half of those who were hospitalized and in the ICU for their COVID will report persistent changes in their thinking and mood. Um, and those even who were not hospitalized are at increased risk for reporting long COVID symptoms relative to their, um, to their sort of matched peers who didn't have COVID. I'm part of the Hopkins post-acute COVID team, and we assess the cognitive functioning. We test patients' functioning rather than, um, and we ask them how they're doing, um, about four months after their illness. And these are our data for um, around 82 patients, I believe. And so what we see here is that we expect most patients to be in this light bluish gray um, box here at the top. That's the average range. Um, but we're seeing that most of our patients are falling or on average are falling below uh, where we might expect. They're not significantly far below expectations. They may be still in the average range or the low average range on average, but that translates into real frustration and um, challenges in everyday life for our patients. Additionally, we ask patients about their mood symptoms and our data parallel what we see in the literature more broadly that even four months after acute illness, our patients who were in the ICU, as well as those who were not, who were in the lighter color blue, they're reporting clinically significant symptoms of depression, anxiety. Um, our ICU patients are the only ones who are asked about symptoms of PTSD or post-traumatic distress. And we're seeing about a quarter of our patients reporting um, clinically meaningful levels of PTSD. And very importantly, um, a, a more than half of our patients are saying that these cognitive changes and mental health changes specifically are translating into difficulties with performing your activities of daily living, like going to work and doing all of the things that we do every day. So there's a real need for treatment. And the goals for neuropsychological rehab following COVID are really three. Uh, we want to improve functioning. We want to improve coping strategies. And ultimately the goal is to improve quality of life. And so improving functioning really means tailoring the rehab program to the symptoms that a patient is reporting or experiencing. So it may be only cognitive functioning, 
It may be only emotional well being. It may be helping patients manage the distress or manage um, their challenging physical symptoms like fatigue and sleep and pain and getting those under better control, or it may be a combination of all of those. Um, but I think the key point I want to, to drive home is that the fact that cognitive or mental health treatments can help improve functioning and well-being after COVID doesn't mean that COVID is you know, not real, that it's all in your head. In fact, we use these approaches with a number of different types of patient populations where we know very clearly what the pathology or the injury is. Patients with stroke, patients with brain tumors or brain injuries, um, patients with um, dementias like Alzheimer's disease, um, and they benefit. And we think that long COVID patients will as well. But that conversation about is this real or is this not, it, it's not a useful one. Our, our goal is to get people functioning better. Um, and some of that is helping, <laughs> helping with the coping skills. That's a natural part of, of um, you know, adjusting to an illness. And I think we need to take some of the stigma away from that. Um, so as we've, you've probably heard throughout some of this that we don't have COVID specific neuropsychological intervention research. There is cognitive rehab being done. It's often being paired up with other forms of rehab. So we haven't quite teased apart um, the, the effect of the cognitive rehab for long COVID. Um, but what we're doing is essentially targeting our treatments or interventions based on what the patient is saying is bothering them. Uh, we're using our interventions or treatments that have shown to be efficacious or useful in other patient populations. We've got good data and research behind it. And ideally, although not as often as we'd like, we can do this as part of a multidisciplinary team, meaning that if a patient is having really significant depression and might benefit from an antidepressant to help boost them along as we're starting this rehab process, we have psychiatry on board. We have speech language pathologists and rehab psychologists to help um, and neuropsychologists as well. But sometimes that's not the case. So what we do for cognitive re rehabilitation is first, we need to assess where a patient's strengths and weaknesses are. We often do a small battery of tests to see where your, where, what your pattern is. And then we also wanna make sure that we're modifying any of the modifiable, we're addressing any of the modifiable factors that can contribute to, to cognitive difficulties. And these are things like having poor sleep, um, being in pain, having ongoing mental health symptoms. We, you can take COVID out of the picture. And if you're not sleeping well, if you're in pain, if you're um, you know, anxious or, or worried or depressed, if you're taking medicines that um, cause brain fog, all of that's gonna contribute to cognitive inefficiency. So we wanna make sure we're really obviously addressing those. And then we're using compensatory strategies. We're saying, okay, you're great in these areas of thinking. Let's use those to compensate and minimize the, um, the likelihood of having cognitive errors in everyday life. We, we develop strategies to use your strengths. And then we can also use cognitive rehab to really target the way that the brain functions and build back up those skills that relate more to the brain level. And from a mental health perspective, we have a number of drug-free approaches like cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness, um, sleep hygiene, pacing and graded engagement and tasks to help address the fatigue. And often these are sort of interwoven with one another. Um, and then my physician colleagues may also add on specific medications, although we, again, don't have any FDA approved medications specifically for long COVID neuropsychological symptoms. We're again, sort of um, using what's in our existing toolbox. So my summary points are that changes in thinking and mood after COVID are common. We believe you when you tell us that um, your thinking is, isn't what it used to be. Um, and we really want to focus on improving your functioning. And there are treatment approaches that have been shown to work in other groups. So we really are hopeful and, um, and we want to see patients have that same level of hope. And I will stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you, Joannis. Uh, I, I have a proposal for all of you because I think we are a, a bit out of time. So I think everybody here wants to stay to discuss. There is a number of questions 
and particularly on long COVID. So uh, if you don't mind, I would keep the, the break. I think it's better for everybody to stay here and, and maybe 10 minutes less of, you know, of rest. So if you don't mind, we go to the Q&A about this session on COVID and we will immediately go to the last session on immunization or on vaccination, okay? So there is a lot of discussion. There is a lot of thumbs going up and applauses going everywhere about the, the, the last talk. So thank you all. Uh, there, is a, there are some concerns from long COVID patients about the possibility of these uh, rehabs uh, programs to cause more anxiety and to have not enough uh, follow-up or monitoring. What has been your experience in managing these, you know, concerns and, and, and potential uh, problems with patients? And this is a question for to both of you, uh, Joannis and Tracy. Yeah, if I may go first, I mean, in terms of physical recovery, we have seen that these people improve a great deal. So when they come to us, they are really frail, they have, you know, uh, poor functional capacity, but within eight weeks, they improve to a great deal. And of course, what is important for these programs is to, you know, give the, the confidence to people when they end the program after eight weeks to be able uh, safely to do exercise at home, to do, to increase their daily activities. So um, it is also the social interaction that people have. And as it was mentioned earlier, these people interact with others and they realize that they have common symptoms. So eventually they recover, you know, to a great degree their functional ability, but also they appreciate that they have to work with this program, with this problem in the long term, like others, in order to keep improving. So I have seen only benefits from at least the face-to-face -face, uh, rehabilitation programs. Yeah. Tracy? Yeah, my sense is that, you know, it's a, it's a process and when things aren't moving at the speed that you would like to see, it can evoke more anxiety and worry about what that means for the future. And I think having a rehab team to walk those thoughts through with and talk about is really important because everybody's journey is different. Um, if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that there are just, just such a wide variety of experiences um, throughout the illness process and the recovery process. And so it may not be as quick as you would like, but we have a lot of tools in our toolbox and to, to stick with it and be with your team. And, um, you know, if you feel like you're not getting support, we want to make sure that you're getting the emotional support to walk through that journey as well, because it really is um, part of your overall well-being. It's the physical as well as the emotional um, in terms of getting you back on your feet. I will add something about my experience. I understand it can cause anxiety because as you say, the first thing to do as a patient is to accept it is a disease. It's not something in your head, it is it is real. So you have to accept, digest and uh, try to react and ask for some uh, some help. So just this is, can, can, can take a long, long time. And of course, uh, get in touch with the specialist. Specialists can take some time, but once you take the decision, uh, things m can improve uh, quite a lot. But you need patience, and and I mean, it takes time. Am I right, Tracy? I think that the emotional aspect of uh, accepting it is a disease is is particularly difficult. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think one of the most anxiety provoking aspects of any health condition is the not knowing. And so helping um, some of the therapeutic approaches that I discussed, including acceptance and commitment therapy, those are treatments that can help improve quality of life in patients with lots of different distressing medical conditions. It doesn't take away the fact that you have a health condition, but what it does is, you know, works towards uh, getting to a place of, of peace where you feel like you are an active participant in getting better um, and coping as well as, as one can. And recognition has been a problem for many of the COVID patients for a long time. And probably it is, it is still present because as somebody is saying in the chat, uh, we need to prioritize this problem. It affects a lot of people in the world, millions of people possibly, although there could be some overestimation of that. There is a recent paper made in, in Holland showing that a lot of people are reporting symptoms but not all of them can uh, surely be, uh, you know, 
uh, set out the consequence of uh, real consequence of COVID. So there is an underestimation, there is an overestimation. The important thing is to make the right diagnosis and find a way. But what's your feeling? I mean, Joanne, Joanne knows the problem to arrive to uh, an official definition from the WHO. Do, what do you think could be improved to make recognition of the disease better in the future and also helping patients in this way? They, they could feel their, you know, there is an official recognition, so somebody's take, taking care of them. Thank you, Eva. Indeed, uh, recognition is something that we need to partner with patients. Uh, we are all humans, emotional animals. We are made of emotions. And in the chat, already Sydney and, and other patients were saying, we are impatient. We are patients who are impatient. And this is understandable. We always say from the medical point of view, we need more time and research, but they are suffering. We are suffering. So the thing is that we, in a way, need to help each other. And for instance, the WHO recommends, and already my, my hospital endorses, that we include patients in every step of the research, in the clinical trial research, but also in the population research, or when we ask for funding to our national bodies, or to our politicians. So the thing is that the informed COVID patient is very powerful. Uh, we already see in the respiratory area that the parents of cystic fibrosis patients or even the parents of asthma children, they are very powerful and they are uh, very active. The COVID-19 patient, mm -hmm. in particular, many with long COVID, they are, it's a power and it's a fight that we have to fight all together. Yeah, and I think one of the questions that is going around in, uh, among patients is about what is going causing long COVID. And, and we are already said there's not only one response to that, it is multifactorial. So uh, if there is somebody asking, so if we find that, for example, immune response, the immune disorder is the main cause, do we have a specific treatment for them? Or if it is uh, inflammation, do we have a specific treatment for them? Is there anybody that's able to give an answer or to suggest something? Well, for instance, for the uh, those who had the inflammatory cascade during the acute infection, already there are biologicals that are approved for uh, using their efficacy in long COVID. Already we know that boosters of the vaccine are effective in the response and decreasing the symptoms of many long COVID patients. Mm -hmm. But as uh, we were all saying before, uh, we need more basic research because to date, basically all the treatments are treatments that we were using for other conditions. It's only by doing basic translational research that we will identify these mechanisms and the treatments that work in those mechanisms. That is the point. We don't have a specific test to say, okay, this is long COVID, uh, or this is long COVID uh, due to immune dysregulation. We don't have that. Possibly we haven't developed yet the, the right test, the right protocol to, to identify it. And if that is once we are able to, you know, find and to describe the better, but describe the mechanism, we might be able to offer some solutions, but we'll still need to work quite a lot on that. I cannot agree with you more, Eva. It took days to Chinese researchers to unravel the genetics of the virus. It took weeks to identify a PCR testing of the acute infection. But in terms of long COVID, now it's three years, and we still do not have or a test or a biomarker for long COVID. We don't have it yet. When we have this, will be a significant giant step forward. Yeah. 